This is Classical Ideas with Greg Soden. Welcome to Classical Ideas. This is Greg Soden. After college, my hobby became travel. I took jobs in Hawaii, Mexico, England, and did graduate school work in Canada. Even today, with a family, I still love traveling and learning in new places. Last year, I was thrilled when a friend of mine released a new book about her transformative experiences traveling in Haiti. As a travel and learning obsessive, I am thrilled to welcome my friend Allison Kofelt on the show to talk about the book. Allison Kofelt lives and writes in Columbia, Missouri. She works as the Director of Education and Outreach for the annual documentary-based True False Film Festival, as well as hosting the fantastic True False podcast, featuring interviews and commentary with documentary filmmakers available anywhere you get podcasts. Her writing has appeared in the Los Angeles Review of Books, Oxford Public Health Magazine, and more. She won the 2015 University of Missouri Essay Prize. The topic of today's conversation is her new book, Maps Are Lines We Draw, out now from Lanternfish Press. Please enjoy my conversation with Allison Covert. Allison Kofeld, thank you so much for coming on Classical Ideas. Thank you so much for having me, Greg. Can you just spend a moment and give a potted bio of yourself to the audience because you wear so many hats? <laughs> um, sure. So I um, I am on the show today to talk about my book, which is called Maps Are Lines We Draw, A Road Trip Through Haiti. The book came out um, earlier this year in, in March 2018. And then I believe we met um, when you were living in Columbia, Missouri, um, and I work for the True False Film Fest in Columbia. Um, I'm our education and outreach director, so I get to work with a lot of awesome high school teachers like you, um, and so that's kind of how our paths originally cro- uh, originally crossed. Absolutely. And we have a lot of other things in common, like two, right. two degrees of separation, which we'll get into today as well. <laughs> um, so first of all, before we start, happy festival season. I know you guys are oh. ramping up for the True False Film Festival, which for anybody listening out there, if you're looking for an amazing documentary film festival, please go to Columbia, Missouri and support the True False Film Festival. I've been many, many times and it's probably the best thing about Columbia, Missouri that there has ever been. <laughs> well, thank you. Yeah, we're really excited for 2019. It's it's only what you know, like mid November 2018, but it feels like um, it feels like we're right around the corner. Yeah, and I, to be, and as a connection to last year's festival, I actually just received the memoir American Animals, the book. Oh, by Eric Borsuk, one of the mm-hmm. one of the characters in the film that played at the festival last year. So I bought his book, which is what the film is based on. So that's out there if anybody's looking for something cool as well. Yeah. Yeah. And I think that film is getting wider release. I haven't been following it super closely, but that would be an easy thing to look up. I think it's going to be, has been, and is receiving a, a, a wide release. Oh, for sure. Okay. So Allison, before we talk about the book, there's one thing that I wanted to point out, and that is the fact that we are both terrible at Frisbee. <laughs> yes. So Kim, uh, can we just bask for a moment before we get all serious that you and I are both catastrophically bad at Frisbee? Yeah, it's really hard. It's like really hard to throw a disc in a straight line or a sort of arcing line or a, a, in a way that is supposed to be to where you want it to go. <laughs> yes, I can't tell you what an outsider I felt like for my entire life because I can't throw one of those things to save my <laughs> life. And I read that in the book and I immediately was about to break down essentially because um, it's such an unbelievably uh, powerful experience when you're 20 years old and people are at college playing Frisbee and you just cannot do it. Oh, was that your... I'm so sorry. Yeah. It's okay. Was- yeah, I've gotten over it in the last four, <laughs> in the last fourteen years. I've somehow gotten over it. You've re- you've recovered somehow. <laughs> okay, so we're going to talk about your book, Maps or Lines We Draw: A Road Trip Through Haiti. 
And the first thing I want you to do is kind of set, uh, paint a picture for the listeners. So if I asked you to close your eyes and describe the first smells, touches, tastes, sounds, and sensations of Haiti, what springs to mind first? Well, I mean, probably the first thing I think about is the warmth. I mean, it's and we're we just got our probably third or fourth snow of the season here, which is it's uncommonly early for us in Missouri to be getting snow. But um, so the first thing that comes to mind, perhaps because of that backdrop that I'm currently in, is um, is the warmth. Um, obviously, Haiti's in the Caribbean. And, um, a lot of the places where I was in Haiti, um, were not too far from the sea. So there was, um, some kind of breeze, um, Port-au-Prince is, is definitely, um, a different story, but I spent, I didn't spend as much time in Port-au-Prince. Um, in fact, the early versions of the book were called Trapped Heat, um, which we could talk about in a minute, but that's the skin, the feeling of the warmth on the skin is one of the first things that comes to mind. Um, yeah, and kind of the breeze, and then um, I guess sort of this this fondness for being there comes comes into me. How many versions of the book did you have to write? You just mentioned earlier versions, and I did not know that. Oh yeah, um, you know it's really hard to count. Um, I would say, uh, who was I listening to the other day? I was at a, a conference for nonfiction, and somebody was saying. Oh, there's always at least six. I think it was Gretel Ehrlich. I think she she was the keynote. And I think she said, I always write at least six versions of the book. And I was just like <laughs> nodding my head. Um, I don't know that my number is six. Um, she has, of course, written many more books than I have. So she's more familiar with her number. But um, I think it, in each book, it probably depends. This book was, um, oh, golly, I think at least four or five full rewrites. Oh my um, goodness. Okay. So yeah, what, yeah. what, when's the timeline? Like when did you start? Like did these, was this based on journals that you were taking while you were in mm-hmm. Haiti? Yeah. So at one point I, I really actually sat down, I was giving a presentation on this and I sat down to really try to map it out. So let's see what I can remember from that. Um, cause it gets a little fuzzy with the years I was in. Well, I mean that I know I was in Haiti in the summer of 2013. And while I was there, I didn't know that I was, I think I was unwilling to kind of admit that I was writing um, a book. Um, so I had, I was taking a lot of notes in journals. Um, I was doing audio recording, um, with kind of a crummy little, um, just like one of those, you know, tools that you do to do interviews and stuff, not really for audio consumption, just for note taking a voice recorder rather. And, um, I was taking photos and then I was going back home or going back to wherever I was staying that night and, um, logging all of trying to log my notes and, the, the audio and the photos as best I could. So I, I knew I was going to be writing about it. And that's why I um, had that kind of more vigilant organization after each day. But, um, but I didn't, I didn't know, you know, it was going to become a book. And then I finished the first round of the book in winter, like a full first draft that was closer to like 200 pages. Um, and as you know, the book is, is much smaller now. It's about 130 pages. Um, I finished the first full draft in, I think it was winter of, of 2014. Um, and then I spent a lot of, so like a year, a year and a half later, I think was when I finished it. And then the first full draft. And then I spent many, many months in um, a lot of time doing rewrites because once I kind of had a sense of like, here's all my material or in sort of like a filmmaking lingo, here's my footage, like really understanding and knowing and learning the footage. Um, then, then the, the revision and editing hits a different level because you are thinking about how to organize it. You're thinking about what the impacts are of the organization. And I think we'll, we can talk about this too later. Just like the role of the narrator was something that I really struggled with. So that took mm. a long time to figure out. Okay, interesting. So that is that sounds really, really difficult. How uh, how many times did you think that you weren't going to make it to finish it? Um, you know, I don't know. Um, I I don't know that I was really. I don't want to say I never thought about quitting because I'm sure that's not true. But when you're when you're engaged in a, a regular writing practice um, and you're just you're just working on it a little bit every day, it's more like these these sort of maddening like puzzles that you're figuring out mm. on 
in like in sort of these like they're like they're big puzzles, but they're within this big project, right? Um, and so the actually like stepping back to think about the whole project was was more rare. It was just like okay, like this month I really need to think about you know like this puzzle within the project. Gotcha. Okay, so um, whenever you're working on a book about a country like Haiti, a lot of terminology gets really challenging to navigate. So there are these terms in the book that you toss around a lot, like developed country, developing country. And I would say that the amount of uh, people from our country, the United States, that have ever been to Haiti is like really infinitesimally small. So what do these dichotomous terms developed and developing mean to you now after having the experiences that you've had? Well, you know, I think it's a, it's a good question because it, the question that you're asking, um, also it gets at something that I think the book is really trying to do, which is the book really tries to draw attention to the rhetoric of, um, separation. And, um, it also tries to, um, kind of, tear that down, I think, in some ways, tear down the the feeling of separateness. So one of the things that I think, you know, is I, in the section in the book where we talk about the language that um, I think the, the line I use is we use to describe them or something like that, it's really, it's really trying to also point out that it's often language that's othering. Um, and it's language that generally goes one way, like no one, I don't know that many that many people in Haiti who are just like not working in development, which is a whole nother field, right? That's like another aspect of that word is like the development, international development field. But I don't know that many people who are working, who are not working in development in Haiti or in um, basically poorer countries who, who say like, oh, the U S is a developed country, right? They just say the U S mm-hmm. like they just call it the U S. So um, I think that there's, Um, there's a way of categorizing in a way it kind of gets us out of being specific. Um, and I think each, the specifics matter because they, um, also give us opportunities to think about how specifically, um, forces like imperialism and colonialism impacted each of those places specifically because it, it was specific in every country that's quote unquote developing. That said, I mean, I do use those terms sometimes because they're widely understood, Um, and I think the other piece of that is in that part of the book, I mentioned like first world, third world, which were sort of the holdover terms, uh, or the former terms. Um, and so I, I, I want us, the first world and third world terms were, came out of the way that we, that the United States and the United States government sort of thought about the world and conceptualized the world geopolitically after the, um, cold war. So like the United States was the first world, um, the Soviet Union was the second world, and then everything that had been a former colony was a third world. So I think even though we may say developing developed now, it's it's still reflecting that um, that worldview. And I think it's important in language to think about, even if we have a new sort of coat that we put on it, what's underneath that. Okay, interesting. Um, and so you just tossed around a lot of historical terms as well. This book is chock full of history, how much research do you have to do in order to feel that you were uh, responsibly and accurately portraying the history of such a complicated place? Yeah, um, it does have a lot of history, um, in part because I think history is just an essential part to understanding an ongoing relationship between the United States and Haiti. And I think that that's true for uh, for a lot of different um, relationships probably any relationship, right? Like we have this history that we carry around even on a personal level. Um, I started doing research in, so my undergraduate degree was in political science and I had been interested in Haiti since high school. So I had been doing, I had been reading about um, Haiti for about, you know, like almost not quite 10 years, maybe eight years or something. And I'm kind of a book hoarder. So (laughs) (laughs) Um, I, you know, I just sort of have had been slowly accumulating a lot of these texts, even ones, frankly, that I just hadn't read. Somebody said, oh, you should check that out. And then I would get it and then I would sit on the, in the shelf. So Guilty. some of those I got to, I know, right. Yeah. It's, it's, it's part of, yeah, it's part of book collection, I think. Um, uh, so some of it was, it was going back 
to to some of those texts. Um, so it was a long research process, and also the, the key component was that I was fortunate enough to be in graduate school um, during the formation of the book, and that allowed me to do even more research and have the library, um, like the power of a yeah. university library, um, and and the time and the um, afforded me the time and and means to really dig more. I want to talk about high school a little mm. bit. This book, yeah, I knew, I knew you would. Cause, okay, because this... Columbia. Yes, yeah. this book originated from an experience that you had in high school. It seems to me, right? Yeah, I think you could say that. Sort of. Okay, in a way. And so I want to talk about the impact of what uh, a good teacher <laughs> can do. And I'm a teacher, and I think about this kind of stuff all the time. And my experience with Matt, your teacher, was uh, I was a student teacher, and I was assigned to a classroom across the hall from him at your mm. high school mm. in, in like 2005. So every day when I would get out of my section, I could walk across the hall and Matt's class would be over there Skyping with Bono or Laura Bush Dude. or Paul Farmer. Or <laughs> he something. never got Bono. It's a soft, it's a, it's a touchy subject. <laughs> oh, he didn't get Bono. <laughs> he never got Bono. He still wants to, but go ahead. But totally like, yes, yes. Yeah. Uh, Donald Rumsfeld was someone we Skyped with Muhammad Yunus. Um, yeah, yeah, so, for sure. Tell me about why those experiences matter for the formation of this book. Like, what did this one teacher, how did he play a part in this process? You know, well, I think, Greg, you also hit on something really important, which is, like, you really never know. I think I think there are – so I work in the nonprofit world now, and a big um, push is m &E, metrics and evaluation, right? How do we measure this? And I – um, think that those are really valuable tools. And then I also think that there are just something like those are really valuable questions to be asking. And we can kind of design tools to, um, to capture that data. And sometimes it's quantitative and qualitative and all those other things. And that's great. But sometimes there are just things that you, I think you just have to try um, to do your best or plant seed or whatever it is. And you just don't know the impact um, that those will have. And I think that's something that feels really amazing to me about the work teaching teachers do and the work of teaching is that you show up and you do your best um and you know presumably and and you don't know what impact that will have 5 10 15 even years later um if any um i kind of lost sight of your question though we were talking about oh the phone calls yeah well tell me about like um what studying this stuff as a high school student did for you like how did this like mm -hmm. change your change your life having matt's classes yeah um well he would be super i don't know probably proud i mean he's probably we keep in touch but also pretty embarrassed that we're having this conversation <laughs> I, I warned him <laughs> so too we'll i told him to send him yeah i'll we'll have to send him the link um I mean, it's really hard to even describe how much of an impact it had. Um, you know, the book is written in this um, lyric um, style, and I use a lot of um, lyrical style, and I use the lyric essay, the form of the lyric essay. But so what I mean to say when I say that is like there's 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 fragment in there, and I don't go, I don't really go super far down um, that path. Um, because at one at one point I had that in the book, but it felt like it was sort of too tangential. Um, it's just hard to talk. It's it's almost hard to say how much it did. The thing I do say in the book is that, um, you know, I took I started taking classes with Matt Cohn when I was fifteen, and I was a sophomore. We had world history together, which is a great. I mean, it's hilarious that like we would have a world history class. Like that's just hilarious. Like in this semester, we're just going to cover world history. But, um, you know, we that that was a great class. Um, something that he really he really loved was like as introducing his students to um, the world beyond the United States and including and and injustice within the United States. Um, but I took that class, that world class, when I was fifteen, and I. Um, ended up basically just kind of continuing to take whatever classes or extracurricular activities I could with um, Matt, which at the time, who at the time was Mr. Cohn. Um, and it's, it's one of those things that 
I think it was really crucial that I took those in high school because I was really looking for a chance to kind of escape um, the kind of insular high school, you know, bullshit, you know, it's just like, I just really wanted to, I think in some ways reading about far off places or um, under starting to, to read about, about big, huge problems that honestly are, are daunting and depressing and, and generationally set up, you know, something like the U S prison system or something. Um, those, those things in some ways offered me a way of just reminding myself that there was like this huge, big world out there. And also I think I was young and, and, and the idealism of that comes with that, like, Oh, we can change this, you know, change, um, which I still feel in some ways I'm not like a cynic now, but I think it was a confluence of like being young, being wanting to, wanting to explore and hear about a world that was like more than just sort of high school, um, nonsense. And then, um, you know, like having this teacher who's like really magnetic. I mean, he's just like, he's a great speaker and he really inspires students. And then he really challenges students individually, um, kind of does this like one-on-one thing where he'll sort of meet you where you are and then be like, you should read this book or blah, 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 you know? Um, and so that was, that was a big part of it. And he made you read Mountains Beyond Mountains by Tracy Kidder, which well, I remember he gave me a copy of that too. Yeah, that was um, exactly. Um, made is, I, I actually, re- I remember it because I also had this, I had to sort of, uh, this in early drafts of the book, is um, he offered it for extra credit. So um, he he was teaching a class contemporary issues of the time where they were reading it. And he had scheduled a phone call with Paul Farmer and the phone call was going to be after winter break. Paul Farmer is um, the like person who's featured in Mountains Beyond Mountains. And he told his world history class that if you read this book, um, you should read this book because we're having this full, cool phone call and like I'll give you extra credit. So I'm like down for the extra credit, right? Yeah. So I read the book and then I have this phone call and I'm just like, Whoa! like, and then I make, my, you know, like beg my parents to read the book and they do. And like, I just, you know, it's just like this thing that um, it's a really... I think the story of partners in health too is just a really um, magnetic story as well. Like it, it really pulls people in and makes people feel like um, that hard work and partnership can make a difference, even though I don't think it's a, you know, by any means a perfect organization. It just, their story really, really resonates with a lot of people. Yeah. So Allison, your book is a slim book. It's a slim volume, But there's a tremendous history behind what led you into this situation. (laughs) So, like, I'm, like, pulling out all these threads about your life that led you into writing this book. Yeah. I love it. Um, (laughs) Can we go into your book now? Sure. I want to ask you to read a passage. And this comes from page 97. And it's an intense interaction. And uh, I'll ask you about it after you're done. Okay. Bonjour, I say. Bonjour. Um, and this, uh, I'll just also say this passage comes when I'm visiting OSAPO, which is a, a clinic that I visited in Haiti. And I'm sort of walking across, um, I'm walking across this soccer field, um, which is like this kind of community soccer field space. Bonjour, I say, bonjour. She stops close to me and smiles. She's tall, an inch or two taller than me, but easily 20 pounds lighter. Give me money, she says. I wrinkle the 11s between my eyes. I don't have any money, I say. See, I stick my hands in my pockets to show they are indeed vacant. Give me this, she says, examining my digital watch, gently holding my wrist at eye level. No, I say. It's a hand-me-down, nothing special, but I use it every day. She frowns. Give me this, she says again, looking at the numbers. I say no. She releases my hand, keeps walking. It's not the first time I've heard it. Give me money. In fact, I nearly gave her the watch. Another common call, usually from kids in the street. Blonde, give me one dollar. This is the ask. You're here. You've flown to Haiti. You've made it all the way to the middle of this field. Surely you can spare it. This is because I am a blonde, yes. Though blonde is not just about whiteness, it's about foreignness. 
A person from, quote, Japan, India, or even Cameroon, writes Jonathan Katz in his book, is, quote, most likely a blonde. Being blonde means having access. It means the ability to choose to come here. It means you have means. So when I read that section, I was squirming with discomfort um, because those are the types of interactions and situations that are heartbreaking um, and true because if I've gone to somewhere far away, I've been on a plane, I've been through an airport, I have a passport, I have money. And so situations like that are something that make me incredibly comfortable. And if I can be totally honest, um, situations like that scare me. And they honestly keep me from visiting places like Haiti because I feel weak and I don't know if I could handle thousands of interactions like that on a trip. Um, can you just talk a little bit about why this passage or what this passage means to you? Yeah. Well, you know, I I mean, it's definitely one of the harder passage. I mean, I, I don't know. It's a hard passage in the book. Um, I go on to kind of talk about the next paragraph that I, I don't know I just want to say it, you know, just to be really clear, I don't, I don't know that I really made the right decision in not giving away the watch. I mean, it's an interesting part where I say I don't have any money because what I mean is I didn't have any money in, on me. I was, I was taking a walk. I had left the clinic where I was staying and I was taking a walk and I didn't have it, my wallet. Um, but of course the, the saying, I don't have any money is a lie. Like I, I do. And I think, one of the things that you that that is worth sort of circling back to in, in what you said is this idea of, of it scaring you. It is uncer- it's startling, and I think part of why is because it really points out the truth. It points out the vast um, gap in wealth and access and life and. Um, life expectancy and health and just all of those things like in those, it just cuts right to the core, right. Um, of inequity. Uh, It just, it just points out the truth. Um, yeah, go ahead. What kind of walls existed between you and the people that you met that you couldn't tear down because you are a blonde? Mm. Um, I mean, many, um, I mean, one of the things that the book kind of talks about um, or mentions or at least explains to the reader early on is that I really wasn't in Haiti for very long. I spent, um, as we talked about, a, 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 you know, a number of years really interested in Haiti. And I spent a number of years not going to Haiti. Um, but then when I finally did go, it was, it was like a couple of weeks, really. Um, not quite three, I think. So... Um, there were a lot of walls. I mean, language barrier is huge. Um, I, I didn't, um, and, and don't speak Creole. I worked with translators while I was there or people who could translate, um, like either a higher translator or I was in settings where there were, where there was multi, multi, multiple languages, including English being spoken. Um, so yeah, I mean, there, there are a lot. I, I think that that also kind of goes back to this narrator question that I really grappled with for many years in the rewrite, because, you know, this book isn't intending to be an anthropological study, or it's not a Haitian person writing about their experience in Haiti, um, or growing up in Haiti. It's not, it's just, there's a lot of things that it's not, it has history, but it's not a history book. It's, um, got reporting, but it's not journalism. So, um, those all also sort of speak to like, I think each of those fields has its own sense of like what those walls are. And when you're writing creative nonfiction um, and when you're writing lyric essay, you, you also it's part of your job as the narrator is to kind of figure out where those walls are. If someone, so th- there's a, there's a common um, term that's used as a, a basically a joke in the United States. And that term is uh, first world problems. Mm-hmm. When, some, yeah. when someone says first world problems, um, what springs to mind for you? Yeah, I mean, I, 
I mean, I don't know. It's kind of unpc, but I even say it sometimes. It's like when I'm complaining about my air conditioner being broken, <laughs> you know, mm-hmm. or I'm like, oh, my, you know, like bike tire. I've had to replace it three times in two weeks. You know, um, it's the kind of it's the kind of perhaps at times poor. I mean, I think it, I think it depends on the context and, and the person and, uh, you know, all those things. But um, it's the kind of thing that points out that, you know, like, yeah, this we have the luxury to sort of complain about these things. Yeah. So you you made a friend in the book. Uh, his name is Dr. Gardy. And um, he is one of the people who seems like helped you navigate and helped you, um, you know, deal with some of the, the, like I said earlier, the walls that kind of existed between you and other parts of the country. Um, mm-hmm. There's a, a little passage that I'd like for you to read about Dr. Gardy, if you will. Yeah. And if you feel like setting up the con- if you feel like setting up the context at all, you you can as well. Yeah. So I met Dr. Gardy. Just a little quick background. I met him through um, somebody here in Columbia. Actually, I um, my primary care physician here in town, Carol Silney, is um, a Haitian American, and so she connected me with um, a woman who's a nurse here, who's a Haitian immigrant named um, Sandra Beldor, and um, Sandra comes up in the book. And then Sandra connected me with Dr. Gardy. So it's sort of like this little network of um, a few a few degrees of separation among like um, uh, healthcare providers, I guess. Um, and so Dr. Gardy is a Haitian um, physician. He trained in the Dominican Republic um, and he runs a clinic um, in the boonies, basically, um, sort of north and a little bit uh, east of Port-au-Prince. And so part of the book looks at how he got to where he got to and some of the jobs he had along the way. Um, Greg, did you, were you thinking the part, we remind me that it says these companies offer on 57? Uh, yeah, that's fine. Okay. Or were you, was there a different part you wanted me to start? Nope, that works. Okay. So Gardy is working at, um, for, for part of his career, Gardy worked, um, as an, as an examiner in a factory. Um, he was examining um, standards in a, in a Haitian factory. Gardy's approval of Haitian factories was crucial to securing contracts with big manufacturers. These companies offer multi-billion dollar contracts, he says, so the deals are very important to the factory workers. They can make or break a business. The traffic on Highway 2 is picking up the closer we get to Port-au-Prince. Once, when Gardy was visiting a factory that produced underwear, t-shirts, and jeans, an executive, an executive at the factory asked to meet. Gardy agreed. I picture Gardy walking into the man's office, both of them in suits, and the man getting up from behind his desk to shake hands. They sit in cushioned club chairs on the near side of the desk, maybe, and the man asks Gardy if he'd like a drink and what he thinks about the tour. He asked how Gardy's family is doing. Gardy says, fine. The man leans back and rests his elbows on the chair's armrests. It plays like a Hollywood movie reel in my mind, in part because I don't know what to imagine, and in part because in the cinema, a scene can feel like it is unfolding just for you and simultaneously be entirely separate from you. He offered me a bribe, Gardy says. The man would pay 40000 U.S. dollars for a past inspection. I looked at him as he said it. I had to keep my face neutral. I told him I'd think about it. So this is one story among many that you tell about Dr. Gardy throughout the course of the book. And I just have one question about him uh, in all the stories that he told you. How has Dr. Gardy helped you see the world in new ways? Mm, yeah. Um, I mean, certainly Gardy is, is the main um, person in the book that we get to spend time with, aside from the narrator. And so there's a number of ways kind of in the book that he really helped me see the world differently. Um, I think in many ways in the book, he helped me really um, complicate even further the notion of international aid. I was quite critical of a lot of international aid before um, before I went to Haiti. Um, but he even helped me kind of see just how complicated and and messy it is, even among pe- people who have been doing this for so long, or 
um, even among some of the best organizations. So that was one, one thing. I think that the biggest thing though is, you know, I got to see him actually a couple of months ago. It was a huge, it was a wonderful thing. He was in, he was in Nebraska. Um, and so I drove up to Nebraska to see him and we did a reading together. And I think the thing that just strikes me is that, you know, like I went home from Haiti and I worked on the book and I spent many years rewriting and writing and rewriting and I just, you get so familiar with this material. But for Dr. Gardy, like he doesn't, he doesn't have that distance or that space to, to step back and then like, this is, this is his life, you know? And I heard him speak about health and equity in Haiti again in September. And he's so impassioned and he just, he just lives it because he's a Haitian doctor working in Haiti in a way that like I never will. Um, and it just, it just is a reminder that we can have these heart opening experiences. And then when like, sort of like, what do we, what do we do afterwards? Um, but for him, it's, it's, it's like a constant challenge, you know, it's, it's like ceaseless. Mm -hmm. So one of the things that I did, uh, I left the country in 2007 and I went and taught in Mexico and I bounced around a lot, uh, from Mexico and Hawaii and Canada and England. Um, and what's interesting about that experience is I remember my younger years being much, much happier than like now. Hmm. So, so I've had like so many amazing experiences in the world, but in a lot of ways I'm actually like way more miserable <laughs> than when, than before I had gone on these trips. And like, I'm glad that I went and like traveled around the world and saw a lot of things because I'm not really sure who I'd be had I not gone abroad um, in my early years. Um, but I struggle with, with that as well. So do you ever feel as if you can't be the same person you were before you went to Haiti? Yeah. I mean, certainly. Yeah. Um, yeah. So I, <laughs> I, I mean, it's a good, it's a really good question. I'm sort of chuckling because, um, I definitely <laughs> understand what, what you mean. Yeah. Um, but, you know, I think and I think it's a it's a complicated question, especially with Haiti, because so many people go like that. The mission trip um, tourism is like go and have this experience and then like come back and be a less terrible person. Like that's sort of like part of the pitch. Mm. Um, so I think that that's, you know, like if I also as this is a little bit of a tangent, but if I hadn't even like if I could if I could get more like I would love high school students, especially people or or young people who are thinking about going, um, or any age people, any age people who are thinking about going, um, to Haiti on, on mission trips to read my book, it would be really, um, like I would love, that would be, that would be an audience that I would love to have mm -hmm. to connect with. That doesn't, um, that's a total tangent, but I, I definitely know what you mean. Um, but we also did, so we, I've done like, you know, we, we were in, doing this, um, diversity and inclusion work at true false. And, um, we had a, an, a training session last night, um, we're working with a consultant and a, a local um, person who's really wonderful. And she's, she's talking about, you know, like implicit bias. And, um, she says, you know, it's okay. You know, if you, if you have a bias, she's like, if you have a brain, you have a bias. Right. And if you, if you, if you have a chance to understand your bias, um, and you then choose not to actively work up against it, then we need to talk. Right. So I think, I think part of the, the challenge and privilege and, and craziness of like being an American with means is like interrogating those means, you know, whether that's through travel, um, or whether that's through, you know, working with homeless people in your town, you know, um, but it makes it harder, but I think it makes it realer because you are in connection with those people, whether or not you want to acknowledge it. Mm -hmm. One thing you just mentioned is interesting as well. So a lot of 
NGO groups in the book seem to come into Haiti with big goals and then leave things actually worse. And I feel like they might be coming in with like some sort of like savior mentality, which is a term that appears in the book and is an unbelievably complicated term. But like, why does this happen? Why do things get worse? How do well-meaning people manage to mess things up? Hmm. Um, yeah, I mean, it happens all the time. Right? Um, I think we can all probably point to a situation even in a personal life where someone meant well, and just didn't. It just didn't work. <laughs> um, and so I think when you think of like a situation like that, and you think of it on a on a bigger scale, um, you know, it could be any number of things. Um, they, the group doesn't care about working with Haitian people. They don't care about employing Haitian people. They care about employing foreign foreigners. Um, the group doesn't care about, um, working with systemic, like with systems that are systemic, like a healthcare system or an education system. They're fine to just set up a parallel system. I mean, could we even imagine how infuriating it would be if, like a group was like, we're going to spend one million, no, one billion dollars in Columbia, Missouri, and set up an entirely separate school system. Like mm. we have a school system, like yeah, you know, um, or 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 something like that, you know. Um, so I think there's, I think it's a it's a great question. I, I it's I'm only beginning to scratch the surface with some of with some of those responses. Yeah. So Gardy Gardy would also point out that like it's a business. Um, mm. And that people make money and can go and 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 show pictures of um, Haitian people and say like give us your money and then spend it on their own salary rather than employing Haitian people and um, they caught you know their salary costs a lot more and so I think if Gardy were in this conversation he would also point out how it's a business. Oh yes. Um, okay, so I learned like so many new things in your book, uh, including everything you just said, which, you know, it will obviously take me a lot of time to a lot of other reading in order for me to dive into this. But one of the things that I learned a lot about in your book is the histories of France and the United States in their involvement with Haiti. And a lot of this is very new information to me. So I apologize if I get things um, wrong at all. So please feel free to correct me. But it seems like the Haitians kicking France out of the country led to the United States partially getting the Louisiana Purchase, right? Yeah. But it's never told that way. No. Why is it not told this way? <laughs> why, why, why is it so mistaught when it comes to the Louisiana Purchase and Haiti's involvement in that situation when we're studying history growing up in schools? And what do you think? Oh my gosh! Um, you uh, teach history. No, I don't. Or I teach taught. English. Oh, English. Okay, sorry. Yeah, um, I knew you were in the world studies in the in block, so I, I misspoke. But yeah, what do you think? It's well. First of all, they would have to acknowledge that the Haitians were successful in overthrowing um, a Western country, and yeah. that the people who were enslaved actually were victorious in setting up the first free black state in like the, in the West, right? Ever. Yeah. Ever. In the world. Yeah. Yeah. So, yeah. well, I mean, it, it just seems like there's just this massive piece, like everybody's like, Oh, Thomas Jefferson. And, <laughs> but there's so much that led to France being like willing to leave the region. And it essentially was uh, almost like France, like running away um, in just in shame and defeat. Yeah. Yeah. And I, I mean, I think you hit the nail on the head. So, you know, just to step back too, because this is, it's history that isn't as popular, um, popularly taught, I suppose you could say like, so that when the Haitian revolution came about, um, it was long and bloody, but what it ended in was, um, Haiti won, um, or H Haiti was successful in, in, in winning against France for a number of different reasons. And then, um, in, and then France kind of had been using Haiti as, because of its geographic location, it was sort of this foothold for the region, right? Um, but also, like, so France decided it was going to pull out of the Western Hemisphere um, 
of the new quote unquote new world rather than Western hemisphere, that's mm-hmm. sort of like the new world. And so it was, France was in a position to make a really good deal with the United States. They were, they just wanted to sell their interests in the quote unquote new world. They were, um, they had bitten off more than they could chew. Um, and they were, uh, struggling to kind of keep their empire intact. Um, and so, so they decided to sell the Louisiana Purchase to Thomas Jefferson, as you as you said. Um, and, you know, I think you're right. I mean, I just to underscore what you said, I mean, to acknowledge this would require us to um, talk about um, colonialism in a way that doesn't um, make the U.S. like most of how we teach U.S. history in 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 schools, um, is, is that, that we're the winners, like we are great. We're the heroes of our own story. Um, and so I think it would require us to, to reckon, um, as a country with our racist, um, and sexist, but especially racist, um, past in a way that we, we haven't been doing on a national level. Maybe, maybe we're starting to do maybe, um, but that's a huge part of it. Yeah, there's a lot of purposeful reconciliation that still needs to occur, obviously. Um, And another thing that I learned was how for 143 years, Haiti was paying vast sums of money to France until 1947. So, Mm -hmm. like, they were freed in, what was it, 1803? 1806? You know, I'm going to have to look because I am so terrible at remembering dates yeah it's a big reason i write but yes right around there so for 143 years haiti was paying money to france and all this time france is getting richer and richer and richer in the world until um several years ago when the um who was it aristide Mm -hmm. asked france to repay the money and france basically like laughed at them yeah I mean, what in the world? Like, (laughs) you obviously know more about this than me. So I I was amazed that France was willing to accept millions of dollars for years and years from Haiti, but that now, um, you know, they just like laugh it off like it never happened. Yeah. I mean, it's like, it's, it's, it's something that is so ironic. I think it's, it's just so like the couple of term, the couple words that come to my mind are like, um, it's basically Haiti was paying like reverse reparations. So France, um, violently strong armed Haiti into paying, um, starting to pay reparations. They request, they reverse reparations. So they, they said, okay, Haiti, you, um, you have to pay us for our loss of natural resources and slave labor, even though you're, you know, because you're free. Um, and Haiti refused to pay it for a number of years. And they said like, no. So that negotiation about the reverse reparations that came a couple of decades after the Haitian revolution, what had happened in the interim was that the United States, um, and France had successfully led a boycott so that Haiti was not able to export, um, a lot of the products like sugar, um, that it had, um, planned on exporting because it had been successfully exporting those products and being part of this like global trade. Right. So the, after a couple of years, several years of, of the first of its early years as a, um, country and, and having its economic legs cut out from under it, um, then, then France said like, okay, let's, we're going to, you're going to sign this treaty and you're going to pay us and then, you know, trade will open up and stuff. So, um, yeah, I mean, the, the words that come to mind are like reverse reparations and then entitlement on the part of France. And yeah. it's interesting because the narrative, I think, around Haitian aid or um, or debt relief, honestly, like um, huge uh, loan relief is entitlement as in it's a bunch of basically white countries saying, oh, Haiti, you're so entitled. And it's absurd because, you know, France has been taking money from Haiti on a debt that it manufactured um, for 143 years. It seems to me like no one, no countries in the world ever keep their promises to Haiti except the French to <sighs> demand money from them for over 140 years and keep that promise to collect every red cent. But no other promise yeah. can ever be kept. 
Yeah. Yeah, that's one way to look at it, too. Yeah. So, um, I, well, yeah, go well, ahead. I just wanted to say, one thing I meant to mention when we were talking about Louisiana Purchase um, was that I had a cool moment where, when we were talking about just like how history is written, um, I had this moment where I was looking at this book of the history of Boone County, which is this um, really huge, fat, uh, boring book about just like, um, it was written in, I want to say like, you know, like early 1900s kind of um, thing, but it doesn't really, ex- I think it's out of print now. Um, but on like page seven or like 14, they talk about how basically Napoleon's challenges in San Domingue, which is now the place we call Haiti, caused him to be willing to sell the Louisiana Purchase to Thomas Jefferson. And so it's inter- it's just, there are moments in history books where it comes up, but it's, um, certainly not taught that way and by and large by most people. Um, and it was kind of neat cause I was like, I had finished the Haiti book and I was, was looking up some other history pieces and there, there it was. <laughs> oh, wonderful. Yeah. It was really nice. So, um, as I was reading the book, a question that I wrote in the margins over 20 times is what did you learn about your home? And what I mean by that is that, like, you know, you mentioned the story we tell ourselves as we're growing up in the Midwest. We've talked a little bit about how we were educated growing up. We talked a little bit about the power of teaching. Um, and then we talked about how our story gets altered where you don't really believe the old story anymore when you get back. So mm. what did you learn about Missouri coming back from Haiti? Mm. Yeah, yeah. Um, I learned, I mean, I think maybe one of the most neat connections was thinking about, it was like a reframe around the land that I had grown up on, um, which is, uh, west of the Mississippi, uh, for those of us who, who know, of course, um, St. Louis, the, the Mississippi goes through St. Louis and that's the Mississippi is the, uh, eastern border of our state. Um, and so, I I think one of the ways that it helped me to think was just that, you know, just the, even the land that I had grown up on, like the place um, that I had grown up in and spent so much time in that even that geographic spot could be so connected um, to this place that had felt so far away Um, and, and at times so foreign Um, even if there were, even if there were no like fossils that that we were discovering, you know, that connected us to Haiti, it was just this, this larger geopolitical and cultural and other kinds of, of history that, that, that draw lines between where I am here and, and what's over there. Yeah. You're, I know that you're a big, uh, downtown person in Columbia. I, see, I used to see you walking around a lot. Um, <laughs> yeah, our offices are down there. Yeah, so yeah, yeah. as you're walking around now in Columbia, Missouri, the book has been published, the book is out, the trip has happened. What memory from the book still comes back to you the most often, even though you're so far removed now from the experience that led to it? Mm, um, yeah, you know, I, I I was trying to think about this a little bit because... Um, it's hard to it's hard to pick just one. Um, sometimes it'll it'll just come to me in like this like in, in just moments. Like um, we have a, we have a kind of a gross fruit fly problem right now in our <laughs> office. I know it's exactly what you would picture. There's fruit flies everywhere. <laughs> yeah, um, which is crazy because it's cold out. I'm like, I thought you guys thought we were going to be done here. They're moving um, indoors. They're ready for yeah, you. Yeah, yeah. Um, and so it's like you know we kind of I snapped one out of it. Like I clapped one out of the um, air the other day and I got it. And I had this flashback to sitting in um, the car with this person that I was staying with in Haiti and there were mosquitoes kind of flying around my um, calves and I like clapped it out of the air um, and, and got one. And she was like, Whoa, you're killing. That's how Haitians kill mosquitoes. Like you clap them out of the air, you know? Yeah. Um, and so it's just all of these tiny little moments like, where you'll just do something and it'll remind you of like this sort of, it, you know, that, that never made the book that never made my notes. You know, that was just me sitting, getting like stepping into a car, you know, like stepping into a Nissan Sentra or something like, yeah. you know? So, yeah. 
Um, you said in uh, near the end of the book that you're always going to unpack Haiti. And I'm curious if there's anything that you've unpacked since you finished the book that if you were still writing it, what would you put in? Oh, yeah. Um, you know, I might I might have more about Missouri in there if I were still writing it now. It's also... It's also something that I, tr- not the unpacking piece, because I, I still think about Haiti a lot, and I still think about all of the things I've learned and, and all the things I still don't know a lot. But I try not to think about what else would go in the book, because at some point, you just have to be done. And um, with the writing of it, um, maybe not with the experience and not with the like, connection, I, I hope to always be in touch with Gardy um, and other people I met there. But I try, I try not to think about it because it, it can't change. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. <laughs> Are you uh, still learning from the experience then? Yeah, absolutely. Absolutely. Awesome. Well, it's Allison, yep, go ahead. That, I was just going to say it's interesting how many other um, scenarios, the things that I learned and, and learned from writing the book and learned from being interested in Haiti for like 10 or 12 years, how many other scenarios those lessons apply uh, um, can apply to so yeah well Allison thank you so much for your work I really enjoyed the book as you can probably tell um, maps are lines we draw out now and I thank you so much for having this fantastic conversation with me thank you so much Greg it was really a pleasure and thank you for being such a careful um, and enthusiastic reader it's really nice Classical Ideas is produced by me, Greg Soden. Music on Classical Ideas is composed and performed by Derek Strybig. You can find his music at www.wearewarmmusic.com. If you like this show, please rate it on iTunes, Stitcher, or wherever you get your podcasts. You can email me at classicalideas at outlook.com. Or find me on Patreon at patreon.com slash classical ideas podcast. Thanks so much for listening.